Hi, John. So someone type start on the chat. All right. Done. So let's <laughs> perfect. So let's start with chapter seven. So this chapter is very straightforward. It essentially it's just walking us through how to get our data sets. The majority of times are going to be saved in a CSV file or format, but we can also use other types. And then how do we get them into R? So the learning objectives for this chapter are essentially to learn how to read data from diff using the read R package and the series of read underscore family of functions. And then compare and contrast all the read underscore different types of functions with base R equivalents. Um, in addition to that, we're going to parse character data into other types into other data types using read our parse family of functions again. And we can also list a series of complications that arise when parsing numerical strings, for example, character encodings, uh, and with data, date and time data. Those I think should, and I think essentially they have their own chapter later on because, oh my God, date and time data is the worst. Um, then we're going to diagnose problems that may arise when you use the read uh, underscore functions. And, um, and yeah, just walk us through all the, the different ways that we can import data into R. So let's begin. So let's start with reading data from a file. So essentially the very basic, or I guess the most versatile package and the, the one that the book recommends is the read R package or reader package, whichever way you pronounce it, which is also part of the tidyverse. Um, it reads CSV files, which are the most common rectangular data file type, um, which CSV stands for comma separated values. But there are also other types, right? You can also have them separated by tabs. You can also have them separated by semicolons. You can have them separated by spaces even. So essentially, uh, reader understands that the first row is going to be the header row, and it's going to have the column name, although you can skip that too. And the other rows, uh, reader understands that it's essentially the rest of the data, right? The first row is going to be all the header rows, and then the rest are going to be um, all the column names, sorry, and then the rest is going to be the data. And when we are talking about CSV, it understands that the columns are separated or delimited by commas. So you that's how you sort of um, code it or define it, even if you don't have the separated CSV that you saved from Excel. If you want to do it in R, that's how you create them. And we're going to go through that. So let's start with the first function, which is uh, read CSV. So the first argument in the function, which is read CSV, is going to be the file uh, path or the URL that you want to, um, where the data is stored, essentially. So here you can use the here, here package. But again, um, I love that package, but you can also just use the, um, the path that you have in your uh, directory or, or essentially from the project that you're working in to your data folder, which is where it's usually recommended that you store all your data sets. Or you can have directly the URL. So let's see a few examples here. So if you're going to read um, a file that's called students.csv and that it's stored in your data folder, you can use the here, here, well, the here package with the here function to sort of just put inside uh, quotes, the folder and the name of the file. And then that can go inside the read CSV file, uh, the read CSV um, um, function. So what it's gonna do, it's gonna just read in the, the data set and you're gonna see that it's uh, five columns and six rows. So that's one way of doing it or inside the read, C read CSV function, you can just have directly, like I said, the path or the URL, if you have it stored in in on, in a website. 
like this, look, if you're reading it from a URL, you just put inside quotes directly the link to where the CSV file is stored. And then if we want to transform data during the read, which is gonna be like, for example, if you have um, some of your columns have NA values, but you didn't necessarily wrote them as NA, capital N and capital A, but you have them like um, N slash A, or you have them as um, not available, like directly written or empty or something like that. You can re replace those mislabeled uh, values and let read CSV know that those are or should be read as NA values, as empty values. You can also repair non-syntactic, um, non-syntactic, sorry, non-syntactic column names and specify directly the variable types that you are, um, that you are working with. Because what um, read CSV does the function, what it does is it's trying to guess based on the first um i don't i don't remember if it was the first 50 um values it's gonna just try to want to to sort of guess the type of um variable that you're working with but you can also um you can also obviously be mistaken or if you have certain values that were mislabeled so you can also specify that so if we look at the file that we were working with the student's file we see that the first column, student ID. So this one is in quotes because it's non-syntactic. Syntactic, I'm sorry, I'm trying to put a C in the middle there. Non-syntactic, which means that it has a space in the middle. So student space ID, and it shouldn't be like that, right? The same with full name. It should be either separated by an underscore or a hyphen or, um, you can also use um, like all of them together, but in uh, not camel case, but the other one, not snake case, but the camel case, that's the one I'm trying to say. Um, or separated by a, by a dot, that's also acceptable. So we have to deal with those non-syntactic column names. Um, and then let's take a look at the types. So we're, we have that the first one is read as a double, the full name is read as a character, and then the favorite food is read as a character, which if you see, those are strings, right? Those are, that's text. Meal plan is also read as character. And the last one, which is H, which you have four, five, seven, you have the, the number, right? A number there. But because you have one of those values as the word five, instead of the number five, it's read, um, so the function guesses that it's a character. So we have to sort of deal with that in order to um, relabel it and assign the correct um, type of, of, um, of column or data. So let's start with mislabeled NA values. So here with read CSV, um, the default is gonna be NA. And it's that's essentially what it's going to recognize as not available data, right? Like this is there's nothing here. Um, but if you we look at the column favorite food, it has n slash a, but we have to tell it to the function that that is essentially a, an empty an empty um, value or it's an na and unavailable. So we have to mislabel. We have to relabel it. So the way to do it is we have the function, the read CSV, and then we have um, the um, the path to where the, the, the file path where um, we have our file stored. And then we use the argument NA equals, and then we put it inside, uh, uh, inside the C, inside the uh, concatenated or however you say that. I always say concatenated, but I think it's also, um, I forgot the other combined. Word. Some combined. people combined. Yeah. Yeah. I think concatenate combined. is technically where it came from, but yeah, combine usually works. <laughs> yeah, combine may be better. Yes, combine. <laughs> so we're saying that anything that is n slash a or that is empty, 
this should be read as an NA. So we can, even if it's like, for example, the word not available, you can put that there. And then um, the function will understand that that is essentially, should be read as an A. Let me just see the chat if there's anything in. Well, just that that default, it's, oh, yeah. it's a thousand, thousand rows. Yeah. Okay. So it goes through the first thousand and then sort of based on that, it tries to guess it, um, yeah. the type. Okay, then let's go to the non syntactic column names. So what I, like I said before, those non syntactic, I cannot say that word you guys, but anyway, <laughs> you understand what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially they have the space in the middle, right? So it's not following either a snake, uh, uh, camel case or the snake, snake case, or even the dot case, which I don't remember what that one is called. So that space, it's usually problematic. So we have to, rename them and that's very simple to do with the tidyverse because there is a beautiful function called rename and that's essentially how you can we can do that so we have the students um file so we read we read it in right using the read csv and now we put it into a pipe so we say students then rename the new name equals the old name and the old name has to be in these back ticks right because otherwise it's not gonna uh read it correctly and then that's all we have to do that we have our snake case instead of the non-syntactic columns yes so we have dealt with na's we have read with we have dealt with this um, renaming columns and now uh let's look at another way of dealing with these non-syntactic column names with the package janitor. Another thing of beauty, which is um, I haven't used really janitor that much. Uh, pronounced bad, yes, oh gosh, I don't even know how to say that word. But anyway, the package janitor is one of those other packages that are so helpful. And I don't know, I don't, at least in my world, I haven't heard a lot of people talk about it, but they can actually be very, helpful anyway i'm repeating myself here so it's not <laughs> part of the tidyverse so we have to load the package um separately so we we do library janitor right and the cool thing is that it can handle um pipes so handy functions for data cleaning using pipes and then for example one of the functions that janitor has is clean names so it's going to turn whatever you have whatever column, it, if you have it in with spaces, with whatever, it's going to turn them into a snake case. So if we just do students, pipe, clean names, so that's the function from the package janitor, and we don't even have to put anything in there, it's going to go through all the uh, column names and then automatically turn them all into snake case, which is gonna be beautiful because then we don't have to worry about anything did we use points in some of them? Did we use um, spaces with other ones? What uh, hyphens? No, everything is gonna be separated using snake case. So then it's very, um, you can then handle all your columns in the same way. So janitor, janitor highly recommend. Then let's deal with uh, mislabeled variable types. So with um with by this I what by this what I mean is let's say you have this uh, column called meal plan that is a categorical variable but it should be a factor. So the difference between categorical and factor I think we're going to have a chapter dedicated to each one of the different types of variables. But essentially the categorical is just text, but a factor can have um like levels. So it's so it's, you can have like for example which one of those labels that you're using that comes first and what which one comes second. So you can actually have an order there. John, you have anything to say there? Just uh, you were saying categorical, but it's character. I think that was just a oh, okay uh, ver verbal typo basically. But it's um, a categorical. But it's categorical, right? Because it's it's a category. So it's a nominal well, it, variable it, in a way. It can be a category. A character is just character. And that's the point, is that a factor is specifically 
like a category. It's one of a, a specific Subtype. set of possible types. Oh, okay, versus okay, okay. character can be mean. literally anything. It could be a paragraph of text. It could be, uh, you know, just anything, any characters. Oh, uh, all right, all right. I and think, uh, I think that Gabby means that meal plan is by nature categorical uh, uh, and should right. be should be coded as a factor. But indeed, it right. is now coded as a character uh, column right. or value. Right. Yeah, it's a bit confusing in it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, but the the thing with this is that you can yeah, but if it's you you can change it from character to factor in case or from character to. Uh, double or to a number or numeric or whatever, right? The point of this uh, section of the chapter is that you can tell, um, you can define the variable type that you're dealing with because sometimes there are mistakes, right? In the data that you that we have. So in order to do this, you can directly use um, factor so that we can tell, um, so that we can define essentially the type of data that we have with the with any of the columns that we are working with. So to do that, again, you first you read your data using the read CSV file, you clean the names using janitor, and then what you can do, and if you have to define the NAs, you can also do that before, but then you do mutate because essentially mutate what it can do is either you can modify one column or you can create a new column, right? So with meal plan, we are going to name it essentially the same thing. Meal plan is going to be exact, is going to be or equals factor meal plan, right? So we're just defining it as a factor like that. And you could also do, I don't know the difference I suppose between as factor and just saying factor or as numeric instead of just numeric there. I've never understood that difference, John. So if there's anything that you wanna add there, but- um, As factor doesn't have all the arguments. Um, ah. So uh, I'm trying to pull it up. The as factor just takes X as an, you know, a single argument, whereas factor you can tell it what levels and labels and you know whether it's ordered, that kind of thing. Um, Perfect, okay. I'm trying to like for the other classes, um, like integer, the the mm -hmm. they are uh, you know if you're using the function integer, that just takes an, a length argument. It doesn't actually take the values. So like, um, let me open up my R. Let's see. Yeah. So like if you do this, that will break because it's looking for just a length versus ah, uh, let's see. you know versus as integer. So as is usually the um, make a take this input and turn it into that that type of thing. Now the one I just typed there as an integer one to ten doesn't make any sense because I mean it doesn't hurt anything, but it's already an integer. Mm -hmm. um, but in general the the un the un as version of the base ones uh, is going to um, just like create an empty thing. Or, or uh, yeah, it just like allocates the space for it. I don't know how how general that is. I can't because I know it's not a hundred percent because that's R and R likes to uh, you know, like like factor for example isn't um, you know, you can give that the X, uh, or you know, tibble you can give the X. Those are not mm -hmm. not the the um, whatever this the. Atomic types, um, but yeah, in general, as is going to be your safer, like just taking anything and turning it into another thing. Mm -hmm. Does, okay. um, does s dot factor has any use compared to factor? <laughs> uh, I I think I'm not using it anymore for a long time. I can't. I can't. I can't think of a specific reason i um i think um i think it deals better with if it's already a factor um it'll be faster so if you don't need all the other functionality as factor is going to be factor faster than factor um 
but for the most part, I think you'll most of the time just use factor. Um, I guess if you don't want to risk it doing, well, no, it's always, um, I don't have a good answer for that. I think just speed, um, that as factor is only going to do the coercion to factor versus factor is expecting all these other possibilities. And so it's, uh, so at the end, like, um, it's the, as factor is just doing a, an if else if else and the first if is if it's already a factor oh. just return it and so that's you know that gets out of there really quick um and then the else if it's um it's uh like if it's not an integer um or it sorry it is an integer it'll do some things and then if it's a uh, uh, otherwise it just calls factor at the end so if you're doing, if you know your your input is character, then factor is going to be faster because it skips the checks. But if you don't know what your input is, and often it might be a factor already, then as factor will be faster. Um, mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. pretty much it. Yeah, uh, the documentation and it says it's sometimes faster in details. Yeah, looking at the um, the code, it's going to be. Um, It'll, it depends on what your inputs are, <laughs> which one's going to win. Yeah, that's true. That's Yeah. <laughs> but if we're going to do this, essentially what I'm talking about here, which is mislabeled variable types, then just do this, yeah. the, the factor, the character, the whichever it is that you want to integer, yeah. integer, right? The one that you want to, to do. Skip the as dot. No, no, no. For yeah. anything other than factor, you have to use the as dot. Or for a lot of things other oh. than factor, integer. Like if you have a column of, um, you know, the strings. Mm. If you have a column of strings or characters like that, calling integer on that will will not work. But as integer, will. So I should have you, made that. That here. Yeah. Oh, okay. I maybe I can update the the notes so we can have like one bullet yeah. point with that. I think I mean we're gonna talk about the specific data types in their own chapters. Yeah. So I think that's don't true. worry about it here. Yeah, um, that's true. That's true. That is it's it's a inconsistency that I had never really thought about, but factor is weird. <laughs> yeah. Factors are so cool, but yeah, maybe because they're so versatile, they have so many other different ways of working with them. But anyway. It's, people, factors get a bad rap because if you, like, if you don't know they're there, like all the, um, it used to be automatic strings as factors in mm -hmm. data frames. Mm -hmm. And it would often cause confusion because, you know, like you could have a column that has the number one in it, but if the number one wasn't the first thing in the column, then one might be coded as five in the fact, because under the hood, a factor is an integer, like it, it's turning all the numbers into just an integer index. Yeah. And so it can it can lead to really weird, confusing things. But if you use them properly, like it's kind of a check on your data, because if you say, no, the, this factor can only have these levels, um, it turns the other ones into NA. There's also, That's and true, actually yes. we will, we'll talk about it in the, in the factors chapter that there's the, Tidyverse package for cats, which is factors scrambled up and with a similar or silly name. Um, but it's uh, for dealing with factors and they have, I think it's as factor, let's see, for cats, oh, FCT, for cats FCT, which is a third way to make factors that's uh, better than either as factor or factor. So ah, I didn't know that one. And I'm presenting the chapter, the, yeah, the factor. Oh. So oh so yeah, okay. we will talk about that. It's so it's it's better in that if um like if the levels don't work out, it doesn't just silently turn things into NA, it throws an error. Like, hey, uh -huh. you have this value that doesn't fit in the levels that you said to expect, or you can tell it, hey, there's this NA argument. If you see blue turn that into NA. I don't want that there anymore. Um, I like that because you have more yeah, control. Exactly. So it, it just, it, a lot of the stuff that we'll see uh, that the tidyverse kind of makes new versions of things. And the reason is they want it to be safer. <laughs> so 
they don't deal with the historical this is the way it's always been uh version of yeah. <laughs> these functions they say no but what will what would it be like if we really thought it out from scratch so yeah and i like that because yeah. sometimes what happens is the function is making decisions for us that we don't necessarily want right. to make like what you said with the um marking them as na when they are out, when, when they're not one of the labels uh, one of the levels yeah right. so i like that that you have more control over it or throw me an error yeah essentially yes good, good. okay so yeah continue. we'll talk about that yeah. in a bit <laughs> yes in a few weeks <laughs> yeah. all right let's keep going so here essentially so you just do with mutate you just um that's the way to deal with changing the variable types and you can do a different name for that uh, column or using the same one so just to replace it essentially right now if we um, keep thinking about other types of um, ways to deal with mislabeled variable types we can think of for example h the column h in the same student's database is a character variable because there's a five written as, as the word instead of the number so um so if we have that in the column, essentially, it should have been a five number, but it has the word five. So we can uh, deal with this in di very different ways. But one of the ways that we can uh, deal with it is if we insert an if else uh, test, what, what do you call that, a function, in order to say if uh, h is the character string, so in if h you encounter the word five make it five the number and if not leave it as h and i guess in a way it's kind of like it's like a case when also i guess yeah. in a way so essentially how you do that is again you start with students that you already read with the reader package and then we use janitor to clean the name, and then we use mutate to, for the first one, for the first column that we wanna change to a factor. And then we can add another column that we wanna mutate to, which in this case is gonna be H. And we use the function parse number. So we're gonna use that function to put the if else um, statement inside to say, if H equals equals, the word five in quotes, then modify it to the number five. And if not, else, right, then leave it as H as whatever value it had. So that's a very cool way of dealing with these kinds of mistakes. It, get, it gets a little tricky, I suppose, if you have more than just one five. So if you had five, 10, 15, 25, or something like that, then yeah i guess we would have to find another way but if it's just something pretty easy to deal with like this then using the if else makes a lot of sense and then if we do see that we have here that with h we transformed it into five there's no five word inside here all right so what happens with the other arguments that are in the read csv function so read csv not only has the file path fun, uh, argument, it, it can also um, accept other arguments or it also contains other arguments like comment, skip, and the names of the columns. So for example, if we create this read csv file, again, remember that they are the first values that you're gonna input are gonna be the column names. And those are gonna be separated by commas because we're saying that this is a CSV file. And then we begin with all the values that are gonna be inside each one of the columns. So then we have this, right? A, B, C, and those are the values that we input in that read CSV file. So with that file, let's use the argument skip to say which one or which lines we want them to skip essentially to not read in to ignore so with read csv if this is the data that we are dealing with this is the um the csv file right so it starts with first 
a string, I suppose, the first line of the metadata, the second line of metadata, blah, blah. So we don't want those to be read in to the CSV file. So what we say is keep the first two rows and then read the rest. And then that's how we do it. We have the entire data inside the quotes and then we use the argument skip to indicate the number of rows that we wanted to skip. And then as you can see here, it wasn't read in, right? Those strings were ignored or skipped. Another argument that read CSV has is the argument comment, which essentially what it does is that it's gonna drop all the lines that start with whatever it is that you put in the argument, right? In this case, anything that starts with the pound or um, the pound symbol or the pound sign or what's the other one, or the hashtag. Um, so anything that has that symbol, it's gonna be um, dropped or ignored. So if we say, again, this is all the data that we have and the first line has the pound symbol or the hashtag, and then we put anything that with comment, right? With the argument comment equals um, that hashtag. So anything that has that is gonna be ignored. And then that can be seen here with the um, with the output, right? We don't see that first string, it's just the X, Y, Z and the numbers. And the last argument that we have is call names or column names. Um, so this is essentially a true false uh, argument. And what you're trying to do is to tell it if we have the first row, if we should take that as the headings or the column names, or if we say it's false, what it's gonna do, it's gonna read it as X1, X2, X3, Xn, right? So if we do this, read CSV, and we are saying one, two, three, four, five, six, but we include that column names are false, we're essentially saying the thing that's inside the quote that's just data. We're not giving you any column names. So what it's gonna do, the function is gonna think, okay, perfect, those are just the data sets. I am going to create X1, X2, and X3 for the column names. And then uh, if we have, for example, we want this call names as a character vector for the column names, we want it to, um, we may even have it outside of the function. Maybe we have it defined as a vector outside and we have those column names, um, X, Y, Z in this case, but you can also have them as different things. Then you can specify those names inside the call names argument too. So you again have the data and then you separately say, well, these are my columns. These, should, these are the names that my columns should have. And that's how it looks like. X, Y, Z, again, right? And you can define them outside the function, inside the function. Outside the function, I mean that call names, let's say you defined it as CN, that's, an, that's the, uh, this vector, you defined it outside as CV, then you can just put here, call names equals CV, I think, or CN, I think that's what I said. Okay, and then, other types of files, because it's not just CSV, right? The world is, the world of data sets is very diverse and we have so many different types of files. Um, reader package can handle them all. So besides the read CSV function, we also have the read CSV2 function, which is for semicolon separated files. So instead of being separated by commas, you use semicolon. And that's common in countries that use the comma as a decimal marker. You also have read TSV for tab delimited files, read delim. So this is gonna read in files with any delimiter. So you have to input the type of delimiter uh, inside the function, or it's gonna try to guess the delimiter if you didn't specify it. The other one is the read FWF for fixed with files. So with this one, I've never used FWF files. So you can specify the fields by their widths, 
with this function or by their position. I have no experience with this function, so I cannot offer any anything here. <laughs> I don't even know. Um, the read table, these are columns that are separated by white space. And then the read log is for Apache style log files. So those are other types of um, files. Let me see if I have something. Oh no, okay. I thought I, I saw something in the chat, but anyway. So there are all kinds of, it doesn't even matter what type of file you have. If you have um, parquet files, I think that come, that's come next. But if you have parquet files, you essentially it doesn't even matter. Whatever type of file you have, all the SPSS, which I don't even know if anybody's still using that. If you have SAS files, doesn't really, Excel, just XLS, XLSX, I think it's the file extension. You can also read those in. There are other packages, but the one that they recommend the most are read R. So for controlling the column types, um, again, reader will try to get the type of each column like we just saw. And it's gonna go through the first 1000. I'm so sorry about these two. I think that's a mistake. Uh, but it's going to pull the first 1,000 rows, and it's going to try to guess. Um, if it contains numbers, then it's a number. If it contains true, false, then it's going to be a logical. If it contains anything that starts with the ISO or ISO, then it's going to be um, uh, date or time, but not the, e, not the ISO. But if it follows the ISO standard, which means year, um, month, and then day or day, month, year, and it's separated by slashes or separated by hyphens or whatever, something like that. So it's gonna recognize it as date or daytime, right? If it contains um, hours in it. Otherwise it classifies it as a string or it recognizes it as a string. But this heuristic works well if you have a clean data set, but in real life, I have never in my life been given a clean data set. So I think that's the unicorn. I don't think that exists. <laughs> It's clean after I worked with it and after I've cleaned it. Yes, it is, but I have never been given a clean data set in my life. So let's see how to deal with this. So with the read CSV function, you can um, so you can you can define this, right? Like we've been seeing. Uh, let me see what this example was about. Read CSV, check on the merit date string. Oh, you're just um so the example, yeah, let's look at the output. You're just naming the columns as the type of um, column that they are, the type of data that they are. And then they are, we are just putting in exactly examples of how each one would look like, right? If it's true, if it's false, or just a T, it recognizes it as logical and it names it as true, false, true, because it takes in any of those, it, can be recognized as logical, right? Whichever way it's written, true, false, or these just the T or the S. Um, again, the date, it usually follows this, um, this convention. It could also have then space and then hours, minutes, and seconds. If it's just a string or if it's just um, a character, right? Just text then it's gonna recognize it because it's just a bunch of letters put together. Let me see the chat if someone said anything. Okay, we're gonna go, okay, we'll see that later, John. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, replacing the file. <laughs> okay, um, and then let's see. Oh, what happens with unexpected values, I think. Okay, so most common way to um, to get unexpected values, right? So uh, with detection fails, is gonna be a column that contains something that is unexpected, something that's probably a mistake, and it's not following um, the type of data that the, the rest of the data in that column is following. So the most common cause is a missing value, which is gonna be recorded as anything other than an A. So in this case, we have a, a dot and that the people that made that because I've seen NAs as all kinds of things are trying to say that that is an NA value. So
So then how can we deal with this, right? Um, so it reads it as, again, because we have numbers, but then there's that single dot, it's gonna read it as character as we just saw in the previous examples, because it's trying to guess. So if we have numbers, 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 but then we have this symbol, this thing that is not really a number, then it's probably a character column when it's not. Um, so one approach is to tell reader that X is a numeric column using cult types argument. And this is the one argument that I use the most when I'm reading CSV files um, so that I can, inside a list, I can include all the variables that I want to define the types, especially when we're dealing with, um, with data, uh, with date and time. Um, that comes in very, very handy. And you can specify inside um, the type also, you can also specify the format that it has. So in this case, for example, I'm telling it that the first, um, not the first, but the column X should be read as a double and not as a character. And then uh, that's what it does. It's throwing me an error, it's throwing me a problem because one of the um, one of the rows does not have what I'm telling it that it's going to have, which is a double, right? So then we have to deal it deal with it. And to do that, there is a way to do it with this uh, problems. So if you do, for example, here we did data frame and then read this. Uh, CSV file, and then we do the call types argument, we get the error, and then we do problems, and then the name of that data frame that we were trying to read in, and it's going to tell us exactly where the column, where the error is. So then that becomes super handy in order to understand where that error is coming from, because the warning is just saying one or more parsing issues um, on your data set, right? But which one? So then this is a very simple way of uh, sort of um, debugging in a way your uh, your uh, importing of your data set, the importing of your data set. So problems is going to tell us that there was a problem in row three, column one, where a reader expected a double, but it got a point. So it cannot be read as a, as a double. So then what we do is with the read CSV function again, we just say that NA should be also interpreted not just as NA, capital N, capital A, but the dot. The dot should be the NA. So then when you read that, you do get the double. So so it's a it's a cool way, an easy way to debug your <laughs> your importing of your data set. Okay. So then, uh, oh my gosh, 247. Okay, let's go, let's go. Column type. <laughs> so then the column types that we have in reader are logical, double, integers, characters, factors, dates, and date times. Um, with character, I should say that it's going to read strings, which is understood as a long series of digits, but it doesn't make sense to apply mathematical operations to those numbers. So for example, if we have a phone number, if we have social security numbers, if we have ID numbers, um, credit card numbers, something like that, that you're not necessarily gonna sum or mm, apply a mean to those values, then those are gonna be read as characters. Um, the rest, if it's a number, it could be an integer or a double. The difference between a double and an integer, I should also say that integers are super helpful in the sense that they occupy half the memory of the doubles. So if you're dealing with integers, then mark it as integer. Don't necessarily default it to double just because it's a number, right? So a number should be, or a double should be, um, if it's if it has decimal, if decimal sizes, or if it has like a negative numbers, something like that. But if it's just an integer, just just a a whole number, right, that you're not necessarily accepting um, decimal places there, then mark it as an integer so that you have a lot of free space. 
And then you have uh, numbers and, no, wait, not double, double? Oh yeah, no. <laughs> What's the difference between double integer? No, integer, yeah, it's just a whole number. But double a number. Technically, number is double or integer. Ah, uh, there you go. But in some places, number also means explicitly double. Because, again, there are inconsistencies. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay. So if, if you are in any doubt, use called number. But if you're sure yeah. that you're dealing with integers, then go to integer. Okay. And then also you can do call skip, which is going to skip the columns that you don't want them to be read in. Let's say the part, the final three, the final four, the first column that you just are not necessarily interested in dealing with. Okay. Overriding the default column. It's also possible to override the default column by switching from that list that we were dealing with to calls and specifying default or to reading only the columns you specify using calls only. So how do we do that? So let's say we have this CSV file that we're going to be dealing with, right? Just three little columns. Mm -hmm. So then we say, um, okay, so read CSV, read me this file, another CSV. And then instead of using, when you're using call types, instead of putting here a list, you put dot default to say that the default should be read as character, right? So then um, so then what it does, it's, it's just going to read everything as characters. Instead of trying to guess what it is, you're just going to say it. Everything is going to be a character, essentially. Unless, I suppose, no, no, yeah, I think so. Everything by default is going to be set to a character. Um, yeah, call types and calls only. Ah, and if you want to specify, specifically name which columns should be defaulted, then you can also use the calls only um, argument, which is going to be essentially only the columns that you want to be defaulted to whatever it is, in this case, character then those are the ones that are going to be inside here, this argument. Um, OK. When you have multiple files, oh my gosh, this, I when I read this, I, I felt like this was, there's much more to, to say about this. But <laughs> let's just keep it simple for now. But there's, there's so much more to say about this, because some people have like Excel files with different sheets, for example. And then how do you read that? And then, yeah, it, it gets complicated. Okay, so reading data from multiple files. So we have, again, our function read CSV that can read data that's stored in the same directory that you specify, right? In our case, it has been uh, the, data the data directory or the data folder. But you can also uh, split across multiple files instead of being contained in a single file. So you can stack them all up if they are stored in that same directory, in this case, data. And then you can have like a stack uh, CSV files all together because they're stored as, again, in the data file. And you can use ID, this argument called ID, to add a new column called file, which is going to identify the file where the data came from. So let's look at an example to see how to deal with this. So let's say in the data folder, we have three different CSV files. So we have one sales, two sales, and then this one, the last one, three sales. And then what we do is we read them all in into an argument called sales files. And then what we do is with the function read CSV, we're going to say, yeah, give me all of those files that are in the sales files um, argument, um, uh, what is that thing called? Uh, vector. Vector. <laughs> yeah. And then identify each one of those files, so all the information, all the rows that come from the, from each one of those files, 
put that into one column called file. And then this is what it looks like. So we have the column that I said file. It, this ID column could be named, you, you define it, right? Like you specify whatever it is that you want it to be, um, to be named. And then, so everything, right? All the information that came from each one of those, uh, from the at least the first one of the sales files, you know it came from that one because of that file column. So then it's all a big, um, all those stacked CSV files, I guess, all those three, all the information that came from these three different and separate CSV files are now stored into one table or one data frame, right? And the way to know which file they came from is because you defined it with the ID uh, with the ID column. An important thing to note here is that when you do that stacked CSV file, the class is going to be um, a data frame, a table, right? So it's nothing that we haven't dealt with before. So it becomes super helpful and super handy way of dealing with um, with multiple files or with information stored in multiple files. All right. Absolutely. I, I've like I've rewritten rewritten that dozens of times. I never I never knew it could do that. And I guess I just never tried it. <laughs> yeah. I usually what I do is I put them in lists and then I do all kinds of things to deal with the list just in yep. the a, in the end to merge them into one data frame. When I could exactly. have done it. Yeah, yeah. That in one great. step. Yeah. Yeah. I know. <laughs> but I guess this is why this is why we read the basic yeah. books, right? <laughs> well, that and that's, well, I was going to say, we also have the book clubs that like read through all of the documentation of a package, but I can't ah. find this in the documentation of read ah. CSV. So like, okay, it is, it's in the examples, but it's not uh -huh. in the like arguments. I like to the point that I want to submit a fix because File argument huh. says nothing about it being able to take a vector um, yeah. of file names. So that's that's really huh. cool. It can also take the um it also has a function for dealing with your clipboard, by the way, I just saw. So that's ah. something else I can play with. <laughs> I'm gonna so, look into that. Yeah. yeah it's, it's it becomes super handy because yeah, the way that I've been dealing with this, and it's it's a very common problem yeah. if you will or situation to be in right so yeah i'm gonna look into that clipper then yeah mm -hmm. but yeah because i i was completely complicating myself reading it into lists and then yeah all kinds of different what yeah, maybe like you can deal with it of code? You, you can do it pretty quick with um per uh the map function from per yeah yeah but not, you know, not one command. So this is really cool. It's very good to know. <laughs> yeah, it's one less package. It also, if you're, if you're not using map later, just, if you're like, just using it for that. Once you know it, it like it, it takes out a step of thinking about it. Like it's just, yeah, just give it the directory. Like give it the, the list of files rather. Um, yeah. It's so much easier. So good to know. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> this was, this really was like, hmm, I'm gonna be using this tip because it was very yeah. It's a, it's a very common problem to have. At least I deal with that at least once a day. So yeah, uh, at least once a week. I'm sorry. So then the other thing that we can do when we're reading into multiple files is again, if you have them stored in the same directory, you can use which is a, sort of like a combination of what I was doing before. Um, we use the function list files from R um, to find all the files, list files, right? To find in the data directory, look for this pattern, which is gonna be start with sales, there's something in the middle, and then it ends, that's why we have the dollar sign here, it ends with CSV. So then look for that pattern, and then uh, give me the full names, right? Full names equals true. And then what you have is the paths to those three files. So that's another way of 
getting the path, I suppose, to your file. Okay, and then almost done. But to now we have learned how to import the data set into R. What if we want to write it and export it outside of R? What if we want to, whatever it is that we dealt with and we created in R, let's export it so that we can share it with other people. So to do that, reader or read R also has a function called write underscore CSV or write underscore TSV. And the argument, the most important arguments inside these two functions are first X, which is going to be the data frame that you're trying to save. And then the file, which is the location where you want it to be saved in. So the path to your directory. You can also specify how the missing values are defined. And there are other arguments too. So you can look up the function in with using the, um, the help files in R. But the important thing to note is that the variable type information, and this is crucial, you guys, because I didn't, I guess I, I learned this the hard way this year, dealing with dates, because it's always with dates and time, right? But the variable type information that you just set up when you were tinkering with your data set in R, it's going to be lost when you save it to CSV, because you're starting over with reading from a plain text file again. So if you have a column that you worked on it and you redefined it as factor with all the levels and all of those things, once you write it as a CSV, it's going to be read sometimes, well, it depends on what are we talking about. It's not necessarily going to be read in as a factor. It's going to be sometimes a character. Uh, it depends on how, or maybe sometimes even a double. It depends on, on what type of factors you're dealing with, right? But, but this is... This is an important note, and that's why I put it in like in blue and with you know a little different color here, because yeah, the information it's it's lost, it, it, it's starting over, and then if you want to import it again, it's gonna try to guess again if you don't define those columns right. Um, so then to do that again, write CSV. So first we put the object that we want to read in, and then the name that we're gonna give it. If it's just gonna be stored like that, if we want it stored in a directory, again, we put this in data underscore and then the name of the file, right? So whatever path you're doing. Okay, let me see the chat. Yeah. Uh, so okay, they, nothing, yeah. Yeah, just that they did make the help more clear about the multiple files. Oh. Uh, Vroom is the engine behind Reader. Reader actually uh -huh. uses Vroom for the, the reading and including the like path or file, I guess it is, argument is directly from Vroom. And so in theory, ah. let's see. Um, so yeah, they, they just released a new version of Vroom, which uh, I'm checking, but I think it actually has. Yes, then, so it has the updated health. And so if you, ah. um, if you reinstall Reader, it theoretically should have the updated help now because Reader copies the, the help directly from Vroom. So. Ah, okay. Ah. <laughs> well, you saved yourself one uh, what one pull request or whatever you call that. Yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> that's what I, I was like. This is annoying. It I, you know that it's not there. <laughs> yes. Um, What's the oh, link no, between Vroom okay. and Reader? So Broom is actually used by Reader under the hood. They need to, so they haven't updated Reader yet on CRAN. That's what will have, have to happen for the updated help to show up. You'd have to, or you can oh. rebuild. You have to okay. redocument Reader. Like basically that's all that has to happen. It has to run the documentation because the documentation is updated in Broom. Anyway, um, so yeah, under the hood, uh, like, Vroom is a, it's called Vroom because it's really fast at reading things in. Mm -hmm. And um, since it, like, he made that package separate from, from Reader because it's, like, simpler. It has fewer, um, I mean, it's, it has fewer options. And then Reader is all the options on top of Vroom. 
Mm-hmm. Um, vroom. <laughs> yes. Yep. Because <laughs> it goes vroom. It's very fast. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, just that's interesting. I never knew about that argument, and it's because it wasn't documented. There was no way to like no e- obvious way to know. Mm. Um. So cool. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> so, no, no, it's we're all re- learning here and we're all yeah. learning from you, John. So let's, yeah, <laughs> let's, yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, now let's look at RDS files. These are my favorite files because all my, like the output that I have from all my models, which are these huge files. And obviously my models took like a week to run or something like that. Then I store all of that into RDS files. But RDS files are only files that can be used in R. So there are limitations. But because I'm exclusively married to R, I have no problem. (laughs) So, but Python R users, then you guys, I don't know. But RDS files, (laughs) um, you can also write them by using this function, write RDS and read RDS, which are uniform wrappers around the base functions, read RDS, and save RDS, which it's just, I hate them. And I'm going to say why, although nobody's interested in my opinion, but this read RDS, I always want to call it write RDS. So I always do write and then the capital RDS. <laughs> and then with save RDS, I always do read. No, I do write. The, the opposite, write. And then with this one, I do read. Yeah, yeah I suppose. And that one's OK. But then I always confuse this one, save one, because I'm so used to doing the right CSV that yeah. I, I'm always confused. I'm always confused. <laughs> so now that I know that right RDS is also part of the reader, I'm never using these two functions ever again <laughs> in my life. Because now it's like there's a pattern that my mind can go yeah. through, right? Well, so yeah, anyway. it is. It's weird yeah. because usually like save is more the like, I don't know, the more it would go with load in my mind yeah. not with read like you read and write or you load and and save um and so having yeah. read and save is a, another one of those things of you know it got decided probably before well with rds that probably did get decided in r not in s but it's whatever it got decided 20 years ago yeah and then people were like oh Oops, <laughs> you know, we should have made those match. <laughs> I know. So, it's just yeah. And then we saw the right CSV. It's just that, yeah. Yeah. Like I'm that's where my mind is gonna default to because that's the pattern that I'm sort of used to working with. So then this save RDS is a problem. Not necessarily this read one, but it's yeah. the save one that is just I can never remember it. But now this is what I'm gonna be using. Anyway. For sure. So um so these store data in R custom uh, binary format are called RDS, which means that when you reload the object, you're loading the exact same R object that you stored. Like I said, when you have a model or when you have, I don't know, a data frame, it can be anything that you just, an object that you stored, that you work in R, and then you store it as an RDS file, then it's going to load it exactly like, like it was. So then let's do the student's um, CSV file that we have been working with. And then we can do this by using write underscore RDS and then naming the file students.rds. And if we want to read it, right, if we want to import it again, we only have to do read, RD, read underscore RDS. So RDS files are super helpful. And then with Arrow, which I'm relatively new to Arrow. I'm not very experienced with Arrow, but Arrow is it's a nice package that allows you to deal with huge data sets, right? So in order for you to not run out of memory, then Arrow is the package to go. So Arrow allows you to read in and write parquet files or this parquet. I, I don't know how to say that in English, but parquet, parquet file. Parquet. 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 Okay. okay. Parquet, let's be a little French, parquet. Yeah. Yep. So <laughs> these parquet files um, are a very fast binary file, and it can be read and shared across programming languages, including Python, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. So parquet tends to be much faster than RDS and is usable outside of R, but you have to have the Arrow package installed and loaded. 
And the functions again are write underscore parquet and read underscore parquet. And the extension, the extension, no, the, the way the file ends is instead of dot CSV or dot RDS, it's going to be dot parquet. Okay, and then there are two, this is the last thing from this chapter. There are two very useful functions to help you assemble a table by hand, which a table is like a data frame, but it's um, part of the tidyverse way of dealing with things, right, John? Yeah. Okay, so then you have tables and tribbles. So a table is going to be a, a two, uh, like a normal data frame, uh, rows and columns. And then a treble is short for transposed table. Hmm. So table is going to work by column. And treble lets you lay out your data row by row. So let's look at some examples. So if I do table like this, so I define first the name of the column and then the data inside one of this. Um, oh my gosh, again, concatenate? No, it's um, combined. Combined, yes. C. Combined numbers, <laughs> yeah, the C, yeah. And then I have a Y and a Z column. And then my output looks normal, right? Like usually X, Y, and Z. But if I do a treble, what I do is I define the column names using the tilde, I think it's called. So tilde X, tilde Y, and tilde Z. And then one, two, five, those are the values that are going to be assigned to the first one. So it's a little bit like the CSV way of doing things that we saw before. And then the second column or the second values in each one of these rows are gonna uh, are gonna be assigned to the second column. In this case, it's Y. And then the third value for each row is gonna be assigned to the third, um, to the third column. So that's the treble. Again, a normal database, just different ways of inputting the the information inside one, each one of the functions. And then this is just a little summary of what we saw here. And then there were a couple of exercises and I have them, I uh, um, put my answers in using this little um, gray lines. I never know how to put the, uh, the answers to each one of the exercises so that's usually mm -hmm. how I do it and then you can walk through those if you have any questions or something you can let me know and then that's it you guys that all right. is all we have for <laughs> today so I went off on another tangent because I had to find this thing that I couldn't quite <laughs> remember what I, don't, I haven't gotten in the habit of using it yet but there's a package mm -hmm. QS it's just that yeah. that okay. it's like uh it's reader but fast or sorry rds but faster so ah. um it's a format just for r for saving and and uh loading data um oh. but it, uh but it's faster so if you're if you're like storing it i think it's slightly smaller too i think it compresses it better uh -huh. um, but it stores it, you know, it's that same thing where it is the R object. So when you load it back in, it's the the object again. Um, I haven't used it that much, so I might have totally just described it wrong. But um, uh, yeah, so it's a lightning fast and completely re complete replacement for the save RDS and read RDS functions in R. Um, uh -huh. So uh, the format is going to be .qs? Yes. Okay. Um, huh. So if like file read and write is your limit for something, um, QS is helpful. Like, okay. uh, I, I don't know. I had a, like even reading it remotely, reading and writing remotely, it was noticeably way faster than RDS. The one time I had a use for it. Not that I've had a use for it many times. I just always forget it exists, um, but someone introduced me to it and it was very nice for large data for I'm gonna large, keep that in mind. our specific data <laughs> yeah so I keep um, it in mind thanks that was a good tip yeah and yeah uh Laura's 
link to the vignette all about why. <laughs> um, and it shows you, and it compares, there's this other package, FST, which is a, the same idea, but um, I think QS usually wins. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, cool. Uh, went a bit over, but uh, yes, we made I'm it so through. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> I Whatever, like it is what it is. So like I said, next week, I probably won't be on the call. So start without me. Um, and uh, the weeks coming up after that, I may or may not, depending on what we're doing uh, as a family. But, you know, hopefully everyone or hopefully we'll have a core enough people and like I'll, I'll try to be there in all of them um yeah so that's it <laughs> okay i'll be here right. i don't want to miss any of our, <laughs> of our of our meeting so i'll be here all right whoever's presenting all right you guys stop right. let's stop what?